I'm very excited to be part of this Congress. It's a Congress on Regenerative Dentistry, Digital Dental Congress by Geisley Pharma. My topic, as you've heard, is a little bit different. It's COVID-19 dental practice. SARS-CoV-2 has really changed our world. The latest figures show that four and a half million people are infected, that more than 300,000 people have lost their lives. Now, we don't know how these figures come about. It may be that there's more people who are infected because we don't have enough tests. It may be that more people have died because people will not be registered in many parts of the world as being fatalities of this virus. So yesterday was an article in the New York Times showing that tracking the deaths by another method than checking for coronavirus is to see a curve which shows the number of deaths, the red curve above the normal line, the blue curve. And for instance, you see Switzerland, second line, second from the left, just next to Sweden, and you see this red peak. And this is the amount of people who have died during this time period, more than people normally died during this time period. When we see these curves, it's always been published by the Swiss authorities. We also see that the flu has such effects. And now, of course, it's only speculation, but it's expected that the peak of this curve, the red curve, is due to the coronavirus. And they claim that um, 740,000 additional deaths would have been caused around the globe when you look at these curves of the different countries. So the death toll is much higher than what we expected. So the virus has local and global impacts. It has impacts on health and lifespan of our populations, social interacting and well-being, economical developments, and also it has effect on politics, political activities and processes. The lockdown not only affected the cities, but also dental practices, dental offices. And many of us have not been able to treat patients, not at all, maybe only emergencies, but for sure at a much reduced level. So what is this virus? What are we dealing with? The viral genome is a beta coronavirus from the coronaviridae female family. It has the highest relationship to two SARS-like coronaviruses from bats and is 82% identical to the human SARS coronavirus. There's groups that taxonomically identify these viruses. And they said it's a Sorbeco virus, and they gave it the designation that we all know, the SARS-CoV-2. If we look at 150 different viral sequences, they only show very small differences. So indicating that there's a single pre precursor and they claim that it entered the human population in November or December 2019. This virus is specifically targets the cellular angiotensin converting enzyme to ACE2 in brief to invade the cells. When you look at work done in Switzerland by research group of Professor Stadler at the ETH in Zurich. They looked at genetic profiles of the viruses in Switzerland. They concluded that infections in Switzerland are caused by viruses entering our population, originating from various different countries, as demonstrated by this genomic sequencing. So in our global world, with all these interconnections, the virus can enter our environments from all different directions. And it really has done so. Switzerland is not an island, it's in the center of Europe and traveling in and out of Switzerland is very intense, as it is everywhere around the world. How is the virus transmitted? There is good research on many of the transmission paths. There's the National Institute of Health, who has made a summary. There's a person-to-person -person spread, people who are in close contact with one another. This is how the virus primarily will spread. And this is by respiratory droplets cough, sneezes, talks, and the coughs 
these droplets, they can enter mouths, noses, or eyes of other people. And the virus can spread from persons who do not have symptoms, not have symptoms yet, or don't have symptoms at all. It can also be through contaminated surfaces. So touching a surface, the virus gets to the surface, someone else touches the surface and gets the hand to the mouth, eyes or nose. This is a possible pathway, but it's not to be thought to be a primary pathway. If we make a graphic for this, then we have an infected person here on the left, cough or sneeze, and this can directly affect another person, person to person droplets. And this is expected to be the key mode of transmission. Also an infected person can sneeze into the hands or by touching the face, get the virus on the hands. And this again is a key way of distribution. Of course, here we can easily interfere by washing hands as there are strong recommendations. From the hands, we can have a person to person physical contact and an infection of another person. Again, here, we a physical and social distancing, we're trying to avoid this pathway. And the last one is by surfaces, person to surface to person again. This can be directly from sneezing or coughing or through the hands by touching something. It's not clear how much of this is really important for the transmission of this virus. The other two pathways are clearly the dominant ones. Estimating the generation interval of COVID-19 based on symptoms and onset. Very important for society and also for dentistry. You see a graph here, susceptible person on the right, left in a time of infection, followed by an incubation period from two to 10 days. And then there's the viral shedding and the onset of symptoms. And the viral shedding disappears with recovery or death. Now, during the infectious period, when there's viral shedding, transmission can be to a secondary person. And the onset of symptoms is what is called the serial interval. For us, important is this window here. So people who do not have symptoms because they're left to the onset of symptoms, they can still spread and shed the virus. And you see, they can even be very close to the peak of shedding viruses. So in dental practice, this means that even healthy person are potential viral, sh viral virus shedders. So they should be treated as such. Dynamics of transmission. Here's a graph adapted from WHO. And you see the red box, COVID-19. The axis, the vertical axis is risk of infection and the horizontal axis is mortality rate. And you see Ebola at the very bottom. So the risk of infection is not all that high, but the risk to die is very high. On the other hand, on the top left, we have the whooping cough. The risk of dying is very small, but it's very infectious. And we see also the seasonal flu at the left bottom. So it's considered that COVID-19 is about five to 10 times more infectious and more dangerous than the seasonal flu. In Switzerland, in an extreme year, we will lose about two and a half thousand lives due to the seasonal flu. So far, COVID-19 has caused about 2,000 people to die in Switzerland. And remember, we have a partial, pretty extensive lockdown in Switzerland. Imagine what would have happened without this lockdown. Here's a graph of deaths in Switzerland stratified according to age. And you see that people older than 50 years of age, they are at risk for dying. When you're younger, the risk is very small. And 97% of people who have died had previous diseases. When we look at the people who are hospitalized in Switzerland, again, according to age, can we see that the Older people are hospitalized much more frequently, but there's a quite high number of younger individuals who need hospital care. Again here, 87% of people who go to the hospital had pre-existing diseases on this list. <clears throat> high blood pressure, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases being the most important ones. So I think the graph should maybe be done differently, not with the age, 
but with previously existing diseases and the stratification should be done as such. It's estimated that about a third of our population or 30% is susceptible and at danger for serious consequences, but still means that 70% of the population will not be at high risk after infection with coronavirus. Strategies to deal with the pandemic, shot lockdowns, partial lockdowns, or herd immunity. Different countries have used different approaches. The lockdowns, they all have shown the desired effects in all the countries where they have been used. Open questions still remain. To what level do the infections need to be reduced? We cannot have a lockdown forever. When have we reached a sustainable situation where we can ease the lockdown, go back to some kind of normality, normal lives, without running into danger of a second wave or whatever? So this was the fear in Switzerland. The peak with more than 100,000 people ill at the same time. So the first key element was to keep the numbers of deaths as low as possible. And the second one, to prevent the collapse of the healthcare system. If the healthcare system cannot take care of the sick, then many more people will die. So the idea is to flatten the curve. There are consequences from this, social consequences, isolation of a lot of people, crowding of other people, home office, homeschooling, big challenges, social challenges, economic challenges, loss of jobs, bankruptcies of companies, loss of income. Political consequences is a form of distrust that we can observe. There's competition where there was collaboration before, suspension of political processes. There's also positive effects, of course. So the question is now, how long will this remain? When will it be stable? Will we have a second wave? Nobody knows at the present time. What does it mean for dentistry at large? Dentistry as a profession is part of medicine and patients cannot wait indefinitely for treatment. And good thing is in Switzerland, dental practices has open, have opened up again. The risk of infection in dental practice is a reflection of the prevalence of the disease within the general population. Meaning if there's only few people infected, the risk in a dental office is low. When there's many people infected in the population, the risk of transmission in the dental office is high. So in the past, we've worked like this. And now <clears throat> there's changes to better protection. Will this remain? How will it go on? Specific questions are, will the dental team experience a higher incidence of infection? So are we at higher risk than the general population to get infected? Figures from Hong Kong, figures from China, do not indicate that we are at really higher risk. But the good studies yet have to be done. And will the economical consequences in society affect dentistry? Of course they will, but to what degree? Will they be critical for many of the practices or will they be not? How will the new protective measures during the provision of care affect dentistry? We need more time and we need more protective equipment. These has consequences. One of the means is masks. They're all different kinds of masks that we see around. There's the World Health Organization who has advice for the public when and how to use masks. It's based on research that has been published. Here's a number of more studies. The quintessence is that medical masks and prevent the spread of infectious droplets from an infected person to someone else and potential contamination of the environment by these droplets. So wearing masks will prevent, will protect other people than the wearer. There's limited evidence that wearing a medical mask by healthy individuals in the households or among contacts of a sick patient or among attendees of mass gatherings may be beneficial as a protective measure. We can conclude that when we wear masks in public, we can, can protect to a degree the persons around us. So if we sum this up, different types of masks that are available, 
mouth and nose protector, community mask, scarf, FFP2, and three, with and without a respiratory valve. Let's see the protection for the wearer. The three masks on the left have little protection because the small droplets can penetrate. The FFP2 and three, they have a very good protection. So we are well protected with these. Protection for other people, our environment. The three masks on the left have some protections because the large droplets are caught. The FFP2 and three without the valve also have high protection, but the valve of course eliminates the protection for people around us. When you go back to the WHO page here, how and when to use masks and you go one button below, Mythbusters. I clicked there and found some interesting Mythbusters, some interesting information. This is still an interesting one. There are currently no drugs licensed for the treatment or prevention of COVID-19, but they get a little more exotic. 5G mobile networks do not spread COVID-19. And another one, adding pepper to your soup or other meals does not prevent or cure COVID-19. This may seem a little bit funny, but they wouldn't put it there if it were not news in public and people were uncertain of whether things like this are effective. Let's now go to personal protective equipment, PPE. We disinfect hands and surfaces for our own protection. We wear masks, goggles, maybe even shields, gloves, as we always have. We may wear hats and we wear gowns. Although again, the spread from surface to person is not so well documented, but it's just mandatory for good hygienic practices. Of course, transmission of the virus in dental practice is the same as in the general public, but in addition, we may have problems with improper sterilization of instruments. We may have, or we will have aerosols that potentially could carry the infectious agents in a volume that could be dangerous and we have the problem of inoculation. Aerosols. The volume of water flow through a red counter-angle handpiece is about 50 mils per minute. The volume of saliva production unstimulated is about 0.4 mils per minute and stimulated a bit more than two milliliters per minute. So we will have a dilution of 25 to 100 times and the question arises where they're in an aerosol like this, there will be a sufficient viral load for us to be dangerous. We don't know. So it's best to still avoid the aerosols and use the personal protective equipment. But it's an interesting question that should be answered by research. So now let's go to the recommendation for the management of dental practice. One thing is patients on their way of entering the practice. First, it's recommended to do telephone interviews before the appointment. Then an interview upon entering the practice. It is regularly done at our university with all the patients that are coming. We do not allow accompanying persons in the practice. We have a health status questionnaire the patients have to fill out. We will also check their temperature and we will deliver masks for them. So within the university or a dental practice, people will only move around with masks when there's a chance that they will get closer than two meters to someone else. And the reason for all these interviews is again, to identify people who are at high risk and to identify people who are sick with coronavirus. People who have other diseases to protect them and people who are diseased with COVID-19 to protect other people and the dental care team. Now, once the patients are inside the practice, we will see that there's adequate distance among each other. We regularly, excuse me, go on back. We regularly disinfect the surfaces, the arm handles. There's no newspapers, no magazines. So as little exchange of touching the same surfaces as possible. We use physical protective measures from some of our, our personnel. And patients undergoing care, we enhance PPE for the caretakers. This is from previous days, this image. 
We have patients wins with antimicrobial agents effective against the coronavirus. We avoid every aerosols as much as possible. We allow more time between patients for disinfection and cleaning. And we also ventilate the operatories. It's a recommendation in Switzerland to ventilate for 15 minutes. And we separately manage high-risk patients in special operatories, and usually early in the morning or later in the afternoon, so we have more time for ventilation and for cleaning everything that was possible in con potential in contact with these patients. So now how are we gonna get out of the present corona situation? What will the future hold? What is being expected? Strategies out of the situation. In Switzerland, the strategy is based on three pillars. So possibility for disinfection in public spaces combined with wearing of masks in public places in order to reduce infections caused by non-recognized carriers. Identify infected patients early, isolate them and follow their contacts in order to break infectious chains. This takes place by meticulous observation of new infections in order to see how the numbers develop. And this is something for the epidemiologists, the virologists, and for politics. We continue. Science negates the practicability of a rapid infection of large parts of the population, which will lead to the collapse of the healthcare system. We talked about this before. The same holds true for a controlled process of infection of the population. This process would ask for the lockdown to be continued for months or even years. The long-term effects of the disease as well as the duration of possible immunity are presently unknown. So based on the above, the stringent reduction of infections appears the only reasonable strategy. And this is good news for dentistry. So if, if we have a stringent reduction in the public, we also have few patients in our practices who are viral carriers. In the future, we need better protection of vulnerable individuals limit new infections, as we talked about, better care for the diseased, and of course, the vaccine. We don't know when this will be available. In any case, in dentistry, we will have to adapt and cope with the changed environment caused by SARS-CoV-2 for some time to come. Thank you very much for your kind attention.